Okay, well, I think I think we'll probably get going. Is that, uh, is that me too close to Mark? Yeah, sorry about that. So, uh, yeah, it's it's an absolute pleasure to welcome to welcome Mark Gilles here to the to the to the cab. Uh, Mark is a is a sort of expert in uh, in star clusters and, and and sort of dynamics, and he he sort of started uh, his career or his very distinguished career in astronomy at, at uh, Utrecht University where he, where he did his PhD. And then he then immediately moved to uh, well, jumped across the Atlantic as an ESO fellow working at, at, at in Chile on the VLT. Um, he then moved to the UK, where he, where he won the very prestigious RAS fellowship and took that to uh, the University of Cambridge. And uh, and then I think he moved to Surrey. And then just as he moved to Surrey, he was awarded a, an ERC starting grant, right? So then in in 2018, Mark took this, uh, the, I think the end of this starting grant to, to where he is currently at the ICREA at the University of Barcelona. And that's where he's been since uh, since since 2018. So yeah, it's a it's a great pleasure to have Mark here, and I'll I'll let Mark sort of take it away from from here. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe too too loud. So thank you, Lee. I still feel like I need to whisper to not. I like to be very expressive <laughs> but i cannot Just put it here I have my own volume right, right. Right. yeah like this still good yeah okay thank you very much lee thank you very much also to Tomer and paco for very nice discussions and very nice dinner typical food here in uh, uh, madrid so as Lee said, my uh, background is very much in, in stellar dynamics. And um, I must say I was a bit distracted by the fact, by the discussions about the interiors of stars this morning. So I need to unravel myself from those discussions and go back to the topic of today, which is very much on stellar dynamics. I just want to, out of interest, know who here hasn't doesn't have an astro background and comes from one of the other institutes. Let's make sure that I'm not pitching to specialized. Is everybody here from the astro groups on the stellar? Okay, okay, then I'm gonna go to fifth gear and then. Uh... <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna talk about global clusters. Maybe it is good to briefly introduce that. So this is a type of stellar system we see in almost every galaxy. They contain typically metal poor stars up to 100,000, maybe a million stars that are old, close to the age of the universe. So we think they formed at the very early stages of the formation of the galaxy. And as such, they also contain important information about how our Milky Way and other galaxies formed by looking at their colors, their abundances, uh, and their spatial locations and their orbits, etc. Um, so I'm going to uh, try to convince you today that apart from that sort of role in stellar or galaxy evolution, they're also an, an important contribution to the recently discovered gravitational waves. So in the very cores of these uh, clusters, the the dark objects, including black holes and neutron stars, are packed together so densely that they can make binaries that can eventually uh, collide. But as you can see from the scales, you have to kind of bridge this five parsec global cluster size down to a few hundred kilometers for these two black holes to come close enough to spiral in and observe them with gravitational wave detectors. So that's going to be the topic. Now, what I showed before was 47 Tuck, which is your sort of archetypical global cluster, very dense, very massive. But we have a whole range of masses and also a whole range of sizes or densities. So this is on the other side of the spectrum, roughly on the same physical scale. It's Palomar 5, which is one of the fluffiest global clusters. It's 100 times uh, less massive and about five orders of magnitudes less dense. So the typical separation of stars in the core of this cluster is comparable to the distance from the sun to Proximo Centauri, right? So when this thing crosses the disk, basically it's an unbound system, right? So the density in the cluster is comparable. So it's a completely different system. But I also tried to convince you of that these are very important to understand the role of global clusters to gravitational waves. So a quick recap, this is the sort of standard slide that people who say something about gravitational waves have to show. This is the uh, up-to-date, uh, after observing run three of the LIGO and Virgo gravitational wave detectors. Uh, summary of the, the, the detection. So these are 
it, most of them are black holes of uh, masses between five and 80 solar masses that collide and make more massive black holes up to masses of almost 200 solar masses. And this is uh, one of the big excitements of the, uh, uh, the discoveries is that we know now of black holes above 100 solar masses. And that's where, according to some, the definition of intermediate mass black holes begins. So we knew that the origin of stellar mass black holes are individual uh, massive stars and everything above 100 solar masses is was a speculative uh, uh, object, and but now we know that they 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 exist, right? So it's an exploding field in the sense that we only know of these uh, detections since ten years, and if you look at sort of predictions for uh, the current observing run, which is about is ending in the end of two thousand twenty four, uh, we'll probably triple or quadruple the number of detections shown on this plot. And uh, but we're going to talk about thousands of objects in the last observing run. And by the time third generation telescopes come, detectors come online in 10 years or so, we're going to go to hundreds of thousands or millions of objects, right? So it's all kinds of exciting things you can do about this. But at the moment, we have to work with this sort of 100 sample. Um, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Right, so there's roughly speaking four channels that have been trying to explain these observations. I'm going to be very compartmentalizing the literature, which is a very dangerous thing to do. There's overlap, there's very different flavors of these things. But roughly speaking, people try to explain these black hole mergers by isolated uh, or field binary stars. So these are two massive stars that undergo some common envelope or um, a stable mass transfer evolution that can lead to two black holes remaining bound and spiraling in. Then we have the dynamical channel where initially unbound black holes can become bound in a dynamical interaction and merge, which is what my focus is. And then we have uh, the AGN channel, which is where black holes are in the center of a galaxy orbiting a supermassive black hole. And if there's a gaseous disk, the, the stellar black holes get dragged into the disk, increasing the probability of making a binary in a very similar way as in a globular cluster. And then a completely different uh, explanation is that none of these detections have anything to do with astrophysics, but they are primordial black holes. So they formed in the high density perturbations in the early universe, and um, they have no stellar uh, origin whatsoever. Right. So to give you a flavor of how the community uh, currently uh, stands, there's these two camps are roughly claiming victory all the time. Right. So there's many people coming from isolated binary channel from the dynamics claiming their gold medal, say, we can explain all the mergers. There's no problem. And basically, when they say that, it means there's so many free knobs and dials that you, you can make it work, right? So that doesn't really mean that their model is correct. But I don't know if this picture makes any sense for people that haven't watched the Tokyo Olympic Games, but these were the two high jumpers that shared the golden uh, medal. In reality, we're a bit more competitive than these two friendly chaps. So these guys, they don't claim that they can explain all the mergers, but they claim sort of little prices. So they say, well, there's some very exotic objects called high, ex high eccentricity objects or very high mass ratio objects. They're very difficult to do in other channels. So once we see them, they're ours, right? So we'll claim them. And the primordial uh, field is kind of claiming a victory in a very extreme way. So they have already claimed things that haven't even been detected. So, um, and they don't really, uh, take into account that there might be black holes forming out of massive stars, right? So it's very interesting to communicate with the, them. And probably for them, it's also very interesting co to communicate with us. But that's kind of where we stand. So what do we know so far? So this is a, a summary of the merger rate of the binaries as a function of the, the mass of the, the primary black hole, right? So this is um, somehow accounting for the uncertainty of the masses that are measured, but also the, the volume that we trace, right? So we correct for the volume that we cannot access, like lower mass black holes are harder to see at higher distances. So this is a volume corrected. It's a local universe, redshift around zero uh, uh, result. And what you can see, it's like there's two bumps. There's a 10 solar mass peak, and there's a second peak here at 30 solar masses. And there's a very long tail going all the way to about 80 solar masses. So this is for an individual black hole, right? So you need you need to, to form a primary mass black hole uh, close to 80 solar masses to, to explain these observations. So the, the different colors are the different catalogs. So this is old, and the third gravitational wave transit catalog is, is the latest one. 
Um, so here I show you a very busy plot from Flora Bruchgarden, who is one of the people in the isolated binary, just to give you a sense of what these predictions look like. Um, so this is for different types of uh, physical ingredients, so the different models in different rows. They make different assumptions for all the parameters that go in these models. Um, and just to give you an idea, so the left here is what's called the, the chirp mass, which is uh, a combination of M1 and M2, which is an easily observable uh, property in the gravitational wave signal. It's some power of M1 times some power of M2. So you could think of it as the total mass. And what you can see is that despite all the differences in the different bumps in these uh, distributions that they predict, there's a sort of a common uh, a feature that none of these models predict black holes above a chirp mass of 35 solar masses or an individual mass of about 40, which is due to a phenomenon in massive stars called the parent stability, where we think that the whole star is being shredded apart and leaves behind no remnant. So in these models, it's very hard to form uh, binary components above uh, 40 solar masses. It's not impossible. There are, there are ways of doing it, but uh, it tends to be uh, harder. Now, in global clusters, we have, uh, I showed you a nice image of a very dense global cluster before. Uh, we have two uh, types of uh, classifications. We have the ones that have a, a flat core in their luminosity profile, and we have the ones that are very steeply cusp. So their central densities of stars is very high. And uh, the process, we think, uh, is evolutionary. So we believe that these clusters will eventually look like these clusters over time scales of gig years. And uh, we call this phenomena core collapse. And this is a very well-known and understood phenomena in uh, so-called collisional stellar systems. And this means systems where the interaction time scale between stars is very short, such that close interactions between stars, they, they affect the overall evolution of the cluster. So this is very different from galaxies, right? So our sun orbits in a smooth potential in the Milky Way, it doesn't really uh, care about individual stars uh, around it if they're too far away. In the global cluster, this is very different. So you get, very similar to uh, thermodynamics, you get heat uh, transfer between stars that interact gravitationally. And the final result of that is the collapse of the core. Now, just to uh, give you a zoom in of what happens in the very center of the core, because this is a process that must stop. This is a, an M-body calculation of um, a small star cluster with about 20,000 stars. And I try to zoom in with very high time resolution what happens when you reach this core collapse, so when the stellar density is at its maximum. And what you see if you follow the orbits of individual stars is that there's a, an attempt of binaries to form. Right? So these stars that are unbound, they are so closely packed in, in phase space, in density and in velocity space, that they try to become bound. And you can see it doesn't always work. You have temporarily bound pairs, and then they interact with a third object. They fall apart again. But the final result of this core collapse stage is that you end up with a energetic binary uh, that is uh, able to survive further interactions with stars. So what does this binary do and how do we, why do we care about that for gravitational waves? So the idea is that um, once the clusters have, have formed, these global clusters formed very, relatively close to the Big Bang between 500 or 1,000 million years above, uh, uh, after the Big Bang. And these black holes, they form very shortly after it, right? So stellar evolution tells us within 10 or 30 million years, you have most of the black holes in place. And not soon after that, you have this collapse of the core happening with the black holes. So they sink to the center very quickly, and they make this, bi uh, this binary. And this binary starts to become a bit of a bully. It starts to interact with all the black holes, but it will survive. So what it does, it starts to reject other black holes from the, from the cluster. And uh, eventually, it can also eject itself from the cluster. And uh, it might spiral in by gravitational waves after a long time uh, after this event, or it remains in the cluster, or a new one forms that remains in the cluster that can also merge at the redshift zero universe where we can observe it. So that's in a nutshell kind of how we think global clusters contribute. And to zoom in a bit on the, the physics of these binaries, so the, the, the energy, the, the binding energy that they start with, which is defined uh, like this, so it's the product of the, the two masses and the separation, um, the, they start roughly at the typical kinetic energy of the stars in the cluster, right? So if the binary is above that energy, it will survive interactions. If it's below it, it tends to be disrupted. 
So then when it starts interacting with other stars, it gradually increases its uh, binding energy, right? Because if it accelerates other stars, energy is conserved, it must shrink to absorb this energy that it gave to the third object. And while it, it goes up in energy, it's the, inc the probability of having a, a gravitational wave in spiral is increasing, right? Because the eccentricity is randomly sampled every time from some distribution. And every interaction, there's a probability that this binary has a close encounter with its companion, or one of the companions has a close encounter with the other one, and it spirals in. But this goes on until the binary gets uh, either ejected from the cluster or it merges uh, during uh, because of an in-spiral, and then the cluster will make a new binary, but at a slightly lower energy because the cluster has expanded. Right. So doing all of this, we need to take in a uh, account of the fact that the cluster is evolving, it's growing, expanding because of, of all the heat that's coming from the binaries. Um, so in time, the, the binaries that you make, they become less bound, less bound, and therefore also the probability of mergers decreases in time. So it's this early phase where the clusters are very active in making very tight binaries and uh, that can merge in uh, to in spiral, by in spiral. Now, when I talk to global or gravitational waves, people I always have to say, look, I'm not in it for the gravitational waves. I care about global clusters. I want to understand how they form, right? So the kind of picture of what I try to do is I try to answer the question, how do global clusters form, where and when? And um, the way I try to understand this is by evolving them in time and then comparing the, the, the model results to an observation of a global cluster. And up to five or 10 years ago, the observations we had available were line of sight velocities, then HST came with beautiful proper motions. Gaia came and added more proper motions, uh, et cetera. So there's a lot we can do just with optical. And to me, uh, this was the, the game. So I tried to optimize or change the parameters here, evolve the clusters, and see what do we need to, to explain the observations. And the gravitational wave observations are, to me, just another type of observations. right? So now we get information about things that happened in the past in the global cluster. right? So this early evolution when the cluster was dense, is generating merges at risk of zero. And that's extremely valuable if you want to understand, for example, how dense these clusters were uh, when they formed at a redshift of four. So the goal now is, and I'm working on this, is an ongoing work, so I'm not going to have you to give you the final result today, but it's to kind of close this loop and use observations of electromagnetic spectrum plus gravitational waves to answer this question. Right, so you may wonder, doing all of this, is that do we actually know of any evidence that there are black holes in global clusters? So that's what I need to talk about first. So that game started uh, basically by the search for intermediate mass black holes. Right? They were speculated to exist, and people pointed at global clusters as possible sites where they should be uh, found. So people started looking for basically black holes in the mass range of 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 in the course of global clusters, either with um, dynamics or with stellar velocity dispersion, comparing them to models with x-rays or with radio observations. And there was a lot of excitement, especially in the early 2000s, that uh, massive dense clusters seemed to host these things. But for almost every claim, there's at least one rebuttal saying, well, not really. You could also explain it with uh, either stellar mass black holes or the data had some issues and new data doesn't show this anymore. So uh, at the moment, I think it's fair to say there's, there's consensus that there's no uh, clear case that everybody agrees on. Right? There will still be people say that they believe in them, but for every case, there is a, is a rebuttal. But uh, what was found as a sort of a side effect of this, all this effort to look for intermediate mass black holes is objects in the stellar mass range. Right? So both in uh, external galaxies, so this is in elliptical galaxies where uh, Tom Macaron looked at the X-ray spectra and found it this was uh, consistent with stellar mass black holes accreting inside of uh, old metal pore clusters. M31, there are si similar cases. And in the Milky Way, Jay Strader found with his collaborators several global clusters where very faint radio objects found with VLA uh, and very weak or absent X-ray observations that were consistent with stellar mass black holes with either a low mass uh, stellar companion or a white dwarf uh, companion. So there's also been uh, three objects found uh, that do not show any X-ray or radio emission. So they're so-called dormant black holes. So they have a stellar companion that was found through radio velocity 
variations, very large variations. So this was done with uh, Muse, where people observed thousands of stars 20 times with uh, different moments. And they found that some stars had this 100 or 150 kilometers a second radio velocity amplitudes, which uh, allows you to derive a minimum mass for the companion. And in this case, this was above four or five solar masses. And because of the absence of any light and uh, there being no dust to really obscure this, the only logical conclusion is this must be a black hole. Uh, but they're referred to as black hole candidates always, right? It's very hard to make a definitive statement. Now, these configurations of a star of a solar mass uh, uh, around a black hole of five or 10 solar masses is a bit odd in the sense that if you would work back your uh, stellar evolution model and calculate what the initial mass ratio of that system would have been, it's a bit uncomfortable. Maybe a 30, 40, 50 solar mass star with a one solar mass companion, right? So the current idea is that these systems uh, may have formed after some dynamical interactions inside of the globular where two solar mass stars are in the binary, which is a very common configuration. A black hole flies by, it ejects one of the stars, and then you have um, one of these systems. Uh, if that's true, that means that this would really be the tip of the iceberg and finding a, a black hole with a stellar companion means that there must be a lot of single black holes or binary black holes in those clusters. Another approach we can take instead of going from the empirical side is going from the modeling side. So what is theory telling us? Uh, what do we expect based on simple IMF and age and metallicity arguments? So um, here's what I show for a sort of typical stellar mass function. If you plot that in uh, uh, units of mass in logarithmic bins, it's almost a flat distribution initially. If you evolve that to an age of 12 giga years, the typical age of a global cluster, you can see that uh, all the massive stars are gone. So there's low mass uh, main sequence stars. There's a lot of white dwarfs, some neutron stars. And then you have this, uh, uh, this black hole mass function. Of course, this is a completely model dependent result, right? So different groups in the world will give you uh, different black hole mass functions. But I can say well, within the uncertainty of models, you would get something between five or and 30 solar, 40 solar masses. And then there's a, a fraction of them that um, have a very efficient fallback of the envelope onto the compact object. And as a result, they don't receive a kick. And so those we think we, they are retained in the black hole. And there's a fraction of them that gets a supernova kick, similar to neutron stars, or reduced by the mass of the black hole. Exactly how many of those are in each of these two groups, we don't know. But if you would believe this model, you predict that at an age of 12 gig year, about 6% of the mass would be in uh, stellar black holes that did not receive a kick. And a few percent uh, could have been kicked out or could still be there. Right? So there's an uncertainty there on what you believe the escape velocity of the cluster was initially. And so how many of these black holes would be retained? Sorry. So uh, what we try to do is try to find evidence for the presence of like a large population of these uh, black holes that do not have a stellar companion, right? So if they are there, uh, the only way to find them is through their dynamical influence on the motions of the stars around them, right? So even though it would only be a few percent of the mass, these black holes, they go to the center of the cluster. So locally, the density in black holes could be similar to the density in stars, making their contribution to the kinematics or the, the motions, the, the dispersion of the stars around them uh, measurable, right? So and there's different ways to to try and, and infer the presence of dark mass in the center of a cluster. So I list here a few, I won't go in, uh, in details, but you could be brave. And that's what the people like Holger Baumgart and his collaborators have done. And actually do star by star embody modeling of individual global clusters and trying to fit the density profiles and the kinematics that we get from the data. Um, or you go for the somewhat uh, more fast and more proximate approach where you have some prescription for the distribution of the stars, both in space and in velocity space. Uh, so they're the so-called distribution functions. And you try to vary the parameters and uh, try to see what you need to explain the data in that way. So we've kind of used the, and they're kind of ranked in uh, order of complexity or com computing time. So the, the top methods are the most exact and the slowest method. And these are the most approximate and the fastest method. So 
I'm trying to use a combination of these both um, in an attempt to be both fair, but also efficient. So I show here an example of one of uh, Holger's results. It's the, the one dimensional uh, velocity dispersion is obtained from line of sight uh, velocities for, I believe, omega sen, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, so the data and compared to his uh, M-body model. So by comparing different models, you can find the best fit. And that tells you something about both the stellar distribution, but also the remnant distribution. So um, we have lots of work on individual clusters, but I'll try to only give one very specific example, which is uh, omega sen. It's not a typical global cluster. It's one of the most massive ones. Uh, it could have been a nucleus of a dwarf galaxy that is now disrupted. Um, so by far, it's not a good representative example, but it's nearby because of its high mass. There's a lot of good data of the kinematics and the, and the, and the, the stellar positions with HST. And there's different groups now that have kind of converged that there seems evidence for a large fraction of the mass to be in, in stellar black holes, right? So we have done this with led by Alicia Zocchi many years ago, uh, looking at the kinematics. And we show here different, uh, in different colors, the different types of models based on distribution functions, where we make different assumptions about the velocities uh, distribution. I'm, I'm not going in too much detail. I'm very happy to talk more about this, but, um, and basically we have a way of adding mass in the center that you don't see in the light, um, uh, accounting for the fact that stellar mass black holes cannot be everywhere, right? So it's they, they are in a specific location uh, and that's relatively well understood how, how concentrated they are with respect to the stars. And so in the same year, Holger Baumgart did uh, a, a, an exercise with his M-body simulations. And I'm showing not here the dispersion, but I'm, I'm showing the distribution of the the line of sight velocities, right? So this is what's called the first moment, and, and this is the, the, the second moment. So here it just looks at, can I reproduce the amount of stars as a function of their velocity? And this is a powerful way to discriminate between whether the dark mass is uh, centrally concentrated in a point mass, so an intermediate mass black hole, or there's an extended distribution of stellar mass black holes. And what he finds here is that the, the models with an intermediate mass black hole extend to much larger velocities than observed. So he, he finds the same mass fraction as we found, about 5% of the total mass. And it's really large, but it's consistent with what you expect from the IMF, right? So this is it. basically every black hole that forms from the IMF is still there and has not been ejected dynamically. And that's also consistent with the very large time scale for evolution for omega sen. This is such a massive cluster that if you would start with 5% of the mass in black holes, they should still roughly all be there because the, the dynamical time scale in omega sen is longer than the age. So this is a summary plot of a recent study uh, led by collaborators of mine in, uh, in Canada. So they uh, did a bit more industrial approach and they scouted all the archives and collected for every global cluster for which there was at least line of sight velocities, proper motions, a stellar mass function from HST and surface brightness information. And uh, they applied similar methods, but a bit more advanced description for the mass functions of global clusters. And they find um, that, or this is the NGC number. So these are 40-ish global clusters. So about one third of all the Milky Way global clusters. They show here the, the fraction of the total mass in black holes, which is for almost all of them below 1%, approaching 1% here. And the total mass is uh, somewhere between uh, zero and 2000. And the number of black holes uh, is somewhere between zero and a few hundred, right? So the, the vast majority of global clusters seems to have a much smaller fraction in their mass in black holes than omega sen. So now and that has led us to kind of reinterpret this picture of core collapse um, because the core collapse of the black holes happens so fast that it cannot be happening now. Uh, at 12 gig years. So instead, what has been proposed is that the difference between these clusters with a large, fluffy, low density core uh, and the ones that have this very high density peak here is the uh, the presence or absence of stellar mass black holes, right? So clusters that have ejected all of their black holes, they will start to develop this very high density stellar cusp. And um, the ones that haven't yet, they still have this fluffy core. And this is 80% of the global clusters in the Milky Way. So if that is true, then 80% should still host at least 10-ish 
black holes. Right? You don't need many. You can you can keep this core toughed up by a handful or even a black hole binary can do it. But that's really interesting. And then recently, um, Stefano Torniamento looked at uh, open clusters. And um, this is really tricky because there are only a few hundred stars in open clusters. So just from the IMF, you expect between zero and three or four black holes to start with, right? So in fact, we, we focused here on the Hyades, which is the nearest open cluster at 40 parsecs from us. So there's like 100 something light years, right? So you could put a mirror then and send a signal and it could come back if you are happy before you die. And uh, so the exciting thing here is that we also know a lot about this star cluster, right? So we know about every star down to the hydrogen burning limit, right? So that you can so nearby. We even know from Gaia where these stars are in, in the Z direction along the light of sight. So we have 3D, six, full 6D phase space information. So this is great to compare with direct M-body models because we can easily model this cluster. Actually, this was done by uh, Long Wang. He ran a few thousand models of these cluster taken into account. A large number of binaries, the stellar evolution of individual stars, the orbit in the galaxy. And this ran in two days on a PC with the GPU, right? So this is really exciting. You can now actually explore full parameter space with these very accurate star-by-star -star M-body models. So and what Stefano finds is that every model where the black holes are gone today ends up with a radius that is much smaller than the observed radius of the Hyades. And uh, models where there are two or three black holes, they have an observed radius that is right on top of the observed radius. And every time we show this plot in group meetings or in informal presentations, people said, oh, but, but, but there's a tail here. There's a tail of uh, clusters or models that had no black holes, but are still five parsecs. So Stefano looked at these, these objects, and it turns out these are clusters that had black holes until quite recently. So in these models, the black holes were ejected uh, less than 100 million years ago. So they, they were large until the black holes were ejected and they started contracting to these smaller sizes, but they haven't quite reached it yet, right? So I think this was a very nice uh, approach and he's now trying to do this for more open clusters in the Milky Way because what is nice uh, beyond the sort of stamp collecting of global clusters or star clusters with black holes is that these clusters had escape velocities of a kilometer a second when they formed, right? So if they have black holes today, that means that at least some black holes formed with negligible kicks. And they just they just formed where they are and they weren't kicked out. Right. If there are any questions, please interrupt me. Is it, uh, I don't mind if people do a mid-talk uh, question. Yep. Sorry, how do you know there are black holes and not neutron stars? Um, that's how a... can you tell apart? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, the size of the cluster would be almost exactly the same for clusters with neutron stars or uh, no neutron stars. And it would be on the same peak of like uh, three parsecs instead of four and a half. So the neutron stars are not very different from the most massive white dwarfs, right? So they're very similar. So the white dwarf mass function goes to 1.2 solar masses. And the neutron stars do get large kicks. So if you're lucky and you, you have one or two uh, kept in the cluster, their dynamical influence is very similar to the most massive white dwarfs. Whereas black holes are 20 solar masses. So that, that, has a, that mass range is so different that it causes a completely different dynamical evolution. What I say is if you have black uh, neutron stars migrating and the, and the size at the core, the, the, uh, at the core of the clusters, you wouldn't. Are you be able to tell whether it's a thirty solar black, black hole or thirty or fourteen oh, neutron stars? You will never get thirty from the IMF, right? I mean, you you maybe get one based on the IMF or two. Okay. Because so, here we have like, if you would plot every model had the same mass initially, you make the distribution of the number of black holes. It's between zero and six, with a peak around two. So, so stochastically, you had this very few models that give you five black holes. The vast majority had two to begin with. Okay. And that mass range for black holes is from 20 to 100 or something. And the neutron star mass range is very narrow compared to that. So maybe the progenitor mass number is similar, but the kicks are so large that you end up with zero or one okay. in most models. 
But if, if, you, if, if you would have a strange IMF that peaks at right around the progenitor mass of the neutron stars and they don't get a kick, but dynam dynamically, they won't do anything. They're, they're, bo they're interesting for other reasons, let's put it that way, not for dynamics uh, here. Right, so this is something I um, always feel like it's a bit disconnected, but I, I try to connect it to what I've been talking about. So when I, uh, as a postdoc, moved to Cambridge and uh, started talking a bit with people like Vasily Berakurov, there was all this excitement about the discovery of streams in the Milky Way halo, right? So these beautiful SDSS images where they could get distances to certain types of stars, allow them to see and probe the halo at different uh, distances. And then as they found that this once, once thought swear called this boring bunch of stars was full of substructure, right? So there were streams and things everywhere. And this is one of the first views right now we know of hundreds of streams, you know, at least a hundred streams, right? And some of them are former galaxies. So this is the Sagittarius stream here, which is thought to be, uh, be a dwarf galaxy that's being eaten up by the Milky Way. Uh, others are not very clear. Um, this is clearly a star cluster, Palomar 5, because there's a cluster involved. And there's others here like the GD1 stream, where there's just a stream. We don't, there's no progenitor galaxy nor cluster, but because of its narrow width, we believe this must have been a star cluster as well. Right now, to understand, and after all that, all the streams that were found, there there were no progenitors, right? So there's only a stream, and there's nothing else. So we think there are star clusters, but to really answer that, we have to look at the one system that we know of that has a very prominent stellar stream in the halo, and the star cluster still in it, and that's Palomar Five that I showed before. So apart from the stream, it's also a weirdo because of the the stellar density, right? So as I mentioned, this is density comparable to the to the the solar neighborhood. So it's a really fluffy cluster, and that's probably the reason why it's losing so many stars, right? We have clusters that go through the center of the Milky Way, passing the central black hole at a distance of 500 parsec. And they've looked really hard to see if there's any tidal deformation or streams, and there's nothing there. And this object flies at 10 to 10, 20 kiloparsecs in the low density environment of the halo, and it's just spitting out stars like crazy, right? So what's going on? I started thinking about this well before I was thinking about black holes, right? I was just thinking about why is there a cluster that is so different from all the other clusters? Is it just like an extension of a distribution? So it's a rare, but like physically the same case, or is there something really special about this cluster, right? So because it's in the realm of possibilities of modeling it star by star, uh, actually a few years ago, this became possible. I, I, I thought we should try, right? Just, we know the orbit now, we know exactly where it goes to the Milky Way. Uh, thanks to Gaia, uh, the mass is about 10 to the four solar masses. So we have to start with more because it's dissolving, but we can do this and really try to reproduce this, uh, this thing. So I'll just go immediately to the result. So by fitting individual M-body models, and we could do maybe 20 or 30 models to, uh, to this because the initial mass is above 10 to the five solar masses. So it starts with a typical initial mass of, of a global cluster, but it's lost more than 90% of the mass now. And what we found is that this is a rare cluster that towards the end of its life, it starts shedding stars at a lower rate or higher rate and it starts, uh, then it sheds the black holes, right? So the black hole fraction, it starts to go up in time. And so our best fit M-body model, which reproduces both the very fluffy density profile, as well as the really extended tidal tails. And we don't get some of the features that are in the tails, which is, Another very interesting topic for another uh, presentation. Um, this might be uh, telling us something interesting about substructure in the halo. Uh, we get it right for models that have now about 20% of their mass in stellar mass black holes. But they started with a normal fraction of 4 or 5%. Right? So there's nothing weird about their initial conditions other than that it was a little bit less dense that allowed the stars to escape faster than the black holes. And that's why currently we are at 20%. So just schematically, this um, idea was actually put forward by uh, Sambaran Banerjee and Pavel Krupa in 2011. They realized that in the galactic center, they focused on the galactic center and they said, well, the tidal field there is so strong, some stars are being lost faster than the black holes. So there might be clusters that are containing just black holes, dark clusters. And, and people never really focused on this for the global clusters in the halo because Typical initial conditions don't consider these, these fluffy low density clusters. And so usually what you get is that if you start below a critical percentage of black holes, 
uh, you shed the, the the black holes faster than the stars, right? So um, we can get basically everything uh, from the same initial conditions, right? You can end up with clusters with no black holes or with 100% black holes. Sorry, so PAL5 is on its way to uh, to become a 100% cluster. It's now at 20%, and in our models, it takes about 500 million years to a giga year, and then it lives for a few hundred million years as a, as a, a cluster of 100 black holes, and eventually it also spreads out into the tidal tails, and uh, that's the end of it. So now, as I said, we have this beautiful gallery of uh, streams without progenitors found by Gaia and all the follow-up sur uh, surveys from the ground. And um, now we started to, to under understand a little bit why is it that some clusters dissolve at, at rates that are an order of magnitude higher than some of the surviving global clusters, and it might be all driven by the stellar mass black holes. So the exciting thing about this is that this opens up the opportunity to learn about clusters that have dissolved and how they uh, contributed to the, to the halo, but also how their black hole population contributed to the gravitational waves that we see. So as a summary, what do we know about uh, black holes in star clusters? Well, some of these results are model dependent and uh, sensitive to interpretation, but I give you my interpretation, and that is that the majority of uh, clusters have a low fraction of their mass between zero and 1%. Um, some of them still have their original amount, and a few, perhaps only this one, uh, happen to be in this tail of uh, going up in their black hole fraction. Um, but this might be a pathway that many global clusters have gone through. It's just so fast that at any given time, you're not expected to see many of them. And so they end up sort of in the stellar graveyard of the halo. And uh, we learn about this phase by uh, combining the, the streams and the clusters. So that's a project I'm working on now with uh, a new PhD student. So now for the, the beef of the, the talk, I should go and have a cheat at how far we are with the time. I should actually, it's, it's quite short, so I can do this in five to 10 minutes. So to, to include the effect of the very small scale uh, binary mergers inside of these global clusters, we have to be clever and do some approximations. These M-body techniques can do it, but you can not explore parameter space and Every individual cluster gives rise to a handful of mergers. And this is so stochastic. It depends on how you sample the masses from the black hole mass function, how you sample kick velocities and spins, et cetera. So we had to come up with something much faster than an M-body model. So this is in one slide, uh, two or three years of work. So we realized, like, uh, like Feynman did about many other complexities in nature, the whole thing is complex, but you can capture the, the essential behavior of the system in some very simple physics laws. And that allows you to do something very fast. So we use the fact that many decades ago, Henon uh, realized something very similar as what Eddington realized for stars, is that the energy generation in the center is completely set by the energy transport through the envelope, right? So this is what Eddington realized for the sun. So why is a nuclear reactor not like going crazy in the sun? Is why is it steadily producing photons? It's just regulated by the envelope of this of the sun. The binaries in the center of a star cluster do exactly the same, right? So the rate of interactions that they have with all the other stars is set by the density and the velocity dispersion, which is something the cluster can adjust uh, such that there is a balance between the heat that is produced by binaries and the heat that is being conducted through the star cluster by these two-body interactions, right? So we start with that assumption. And then we kind of paint the evolution of the binaries uh, that I uh, uh, sketched before, right? So if you know the rate at which binaries heat, you know the rate at which they form, you know the rate at which they escape, you know the rate at which they merge, right? I'm stepping over a lot of the details here, but I'm happy to answer questions if you have any. So this allows us basically to, independent of the number of stars that you're considering, right, to calculate in order of a second, the entire evolution of the cluster and the resulting merger rate inside of that cluster, right? So here I show one example of the merger rate of black hole binaries in a 1 million solar mass globally cluster calculated by us in one second. This is black line and calculated by star by star models in a couple of weeks by the Northwestern group. And you can see that we 
of course have a smooth distribution so we don't get all the the noisy features here which might be real and might be important but on average we get the correct result right we also looked at can we reproduce uh, the type of mergers so i showed that you can have binaries that merge outside of the clusters you can have binaries that merge inside and even inside the cluster we have two two different types of mergers um Again, I'll leave this for questions for those who are interested, but uh, for clusters of different masses, you can see that these contribute uh, differently to the, the, the total merger rate. And we also find good agreement, especially for the most massive clusters. Here we start to have some issues that also might be interesting, might not be. Time will tell, hopefully. Uh, and finally, uh, we actually have information about masses uh, and, and spins, but also eccentricity that is remaining at the time these binaries reach the, the frequency that we can observe them with gravitational wave detectors. So at the moment, we cannot, we cannot actually make these observations, but we have the model predictions now to say, well, the distribution of eccentricities you should find if mergers are coming from dynamics uh, is, uh, is this. Right, so then what we did is try to do very similar to what the binary population models uh, have done, is, is do population synthesis modeling, right? So if you have a very fast method, you can explore parameter space, you can vary everything, right? So you need some ingredients, you need how many global clusters are there in the universe per unit of volume. And we use the fact there's a very uh, interesting and uh, so far not well ex understood linear correlation between the total mass of a global cluster system in the galaxy and the mass of its dark matter halo. So just, it seems that for every galaxy, a fixed fraction of its entire mass ends up in global clusters. This might be uh, an interesting clue to how galaxies and global clusters form, but we, we don't really know it, but we just use it as an ingredient because merger rates are measured in units of uh, per year per, per gigaparsec cubed. Yeah. Then we make an assumption about the mass function of global clusters. We know that some of them have uh, been lost. So we start with more low mass clusters as we see in the low, uh, the low redshift universe, we evolve them in time. And then we make an assumption about the rate of formation of global clusters in the universe, which is peaked at slightly higher redshift as the formation rate of stars. And we take this from a model by Karim Al-Badri. And we also include that some mergers can be retained in the global cluster if their kicks are below the escape velocity of the cluster. So we allow black holes to merge a second or a third time. Um, and we have some prescription for how the masses of the primary and the secondary, so the mass ratio of the binary, are sampled from uh, the mass function of the black holes. I I'll skip over these details a little bit and just show you, the, show you the result. So this is the same plot I showed in the beginning. So the merger rate as a function of the primary mass for two of our models. But we have a whole suite of we have millions of uh, individual cluster models, and we have 20 or 30-ish models for different assumptions about kicks and about metallicity assumptions, et cetera. I'll just show you two of them that give you a good result. And then we can see what is it that we needed to get this to work. So uh, the ones here don't include the hierarchical mergers. So black holes were allowed to merge only once. And if we add this uh, possibility of mergers being retained and being involved in the next collision, uh, we can really explain very nicely this uh, high mass till up to 100 solar masses, right? And if you look at the, the mass ratio distribution, this is also reasonably well explained. We get a little bit more of these uh, low mass ratio objects if we allow for these hierarchical mergers, which makes sense because suddenly you could have a 150 solar mass black hole involved with a 50 solar mass uh, black hole, right? Um, now, this is not saying we've explained all mergers, actually more than half of them are here, right? So we really cannot do these low mass, 10 solar mass black holes, which I interpret as a metallicity issue. So global clusters are low metallicity, gives you more massive black holes than uh, high metallicity. So that's probably why we cannot do this. And also we, we had to have a relatively high density for the global clusters. And to keep the, uh, the mergers in, we need to have individual black holes having a low spin initially. I'm not going to go into details if that's realistic or not, but you can ask me about that later. So com coming back to the uh, the, the two uh, gents that were claiming a victory, I think we should really share the prize in the sense that 
these uh, the, the peak here at 10 solar masses is very easy for the people doing isolated binaries at solar metallicity, right? You, you, everybody gets that. And uh, they have to tweak really hard to get this. So my sort of interpretation of those is like, leave that to us, right? We can do this relatively easy. And now the next step is to really understand the relative contribution in this overlap region, right? So uh, it might very well be that also half of them here come from isolated binaries, but um, I think we need more data to be able to tell, which involves like looking at the spin distribution, the eccentricity distribution, and some of the things that at the moment we simply uh, don't have. So I'll leave you with a conclusion. So what about black holes and clusters? Well, they seem to be ubiquitous uh, below 100 solar masses. I'm quite confident that above, above, above 1,000 solar masses, there's really no evidence. But there's this really interesting mass regime now where gravitational waves are saying they may be there in global clusters and there may be ways of finding them in other methods beyond gravitational waves, right? Star orbiting a 200 solar mass black hole in a global cluster, that would be a really nice confirmation of all of these ideas. And then I've shown that uh, hopefully uh, you're convinced that you can actually use beyond global clusters also the streams to look at, learn about the history. And um, our models now allow us to explain at least the most massive uh, gravitational wave sources. Sorry for running a bit late and I'll uh, stop here. Thank you. Okay, th thanks very much, Mark. That was absolutely fantastic. And you can see we've we've organized the jets for uh, as the as the sort of final cutoff in time. So that's that's worked out pretty nicely. <laughs> so uh, we can we can sort of take questions. Uh, we've got time for a couple of questions. So let's sort of focus here on the room first, and then we can sort of open it to uh, to Zoom after that. So I can take Tom up ready with his hand up. So I'll go there first. I could not turn it on. Okay, thank you. It was very interesting. Um, I have kind of two similar questions uh, that are related to the same thing. Velocity dispersions uh, and the usage of velocity dispersions to measure what is this <laughs> to to measure to uh, infer something about the black hole. So first of all, these velocity dispersion studies do they account for binarity for the fact that stars can seem to move faster because of binarity? And the related question is: Is there any hope to see in real time the Aya, for example? <laughs> And to, and to really and to really start uh, infer something from the real time motion of the stars center, where you see stars orbiting. And if
These globular clusters is just of all of them is just to dissolve and then to form these kind of streams where you can have fraction of these uh, black holes. Starting fraction, and it's a bit more complicated than just a fraction of the black holes, but um, let me see if I can quickly put it up right here. So uh, the majority will probably go this route, right? So they're, um, they're on their way to remove all the black holes first, and then it would still make a stream of stars, but it would be a much lower density stream because the rate of escape would be an order of magnitude lower than the ones that go along this branch. Uh, the exact, actually, is a good question to understand. Like, I would like to understand that. Like, how many clusters are going to go along this road and how many are going along that road? But... The statistics are at the moment a bit difficult. Uh, the, the stream data is very incomplete. They're based on surveys that sometimes are these so-called pencil beam surveys. So it's a look at different regions of the sky and then they find some stars and say, hey, there's also a Gaia cross match. So hey, maybe we can look now at the energy angular momentum. And then they say, hey, there's a stream there. But how many we have missed, we don't know. And how it depends on the distance to the galactic center, et cetera. So to do full modeling of the stream population, that's what you need to answer how many clusters would have gone here or are going there. Uh, we don't really know yet, but I, it keeps me awake. <laughs> I'm thinking about this all the time. Okay, thank you very much. Well, that's, uh, that, that, I think that's about all we've got time for today. So if we can thank Mark again. Yeah. Yeah, thanks everyone for, for coming and we'll see you. We'll see you. Actually, I think this was the last seminar of the year. So Merry Christmas. Uh, I suppose. <laughs> and I'll, I'll 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 see you in January. Lovely. <laughs>